the break Hello. from driving music to driving hardware. Um, Diane will talk to us about how we can write the best device driver for Rust. That's a tall order. <laughs> I'll give you the stage. It's a little bit clickbaity, but uh, yeah. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk about how can we write the best device driver. Let's get my slides together here. Yes. Okay, um, yeah, I'm uh, Dion Doctor, um, and I'm going to be talking about this. Uh, so due to time, I can talk about everything I want, uh, so it's quite limited, but uh, hopefully it'll give you some ideas for your next well, device driver. So uh, for the overview, first we're going to talk about how to do the hardware interface. We're going to be looking at how it is generally done in C, and then how we can improve it in Rust. And then we're going to talk about the software interface, and we'll take a, a, an imaginary uh, chip and write a little uh, start of a device driver for it. Uh, so there's a lot of code, but I hope you'll like it. So the hardware interface, uh, what is that actually? Well, uh, it's how we want to talk to the device. And if we look at C, well, we get into a problem because, well, we want an abstract interface. We want to plug in anything. And if you Google uh, C abstract interface, well, it only shows other languages, not C. Um, so that's a little bit prob problematic. So in C, there are three main ways that I've seen people uh, do it. Uh, and I'm going to th go through them all now. And the first one I've called pre-made fill-in functions. So the idea is that you um, you clone the library. Uh, there are some functions provided for you, and you need to fill in uh, to talk uh, to your hardware. You need to fill in some code. And uh, the good for this is that it's pretty performant. Like the compiler has got all the information it needs. Um, but usability is bad because, well, you're expected to clone or rather fork the library and maintain your own hardware implementation for it. So what does it look like? Uh, well, uh, this is uh, some example code. So at the top, we've got some SPI type, which is void by standard, which you can change. Uh, you've got some initializer function that takes the instance and then provides it to your functions over here. And this is literally what the library does. It says to do here, uh, enable the CS pin, disable the CS pin. Uh, I've taken SPI as an example during this talk, by the way. Um, and there is a transfer function. And you just need to do what's, what's required. But for the library side, um, here in this example code, uh, that's pretty easy. You just say, hey, enable CS, transfer, transfer, and we get the result back, disable the CS, and we get a result. And if we look at the assembly, uh, we can see our uh, function over here. And it's all just moves, because my implementation I've written over here for the uh, uh, hardware interface, just pokes some registers, read some values out of it. So we expect only to, to have move instructions, and that's the case. Uh, in all the other examples, I will use the exact same instructions here, so we can compare them all. Um, but yeah, uh, we, we need to maintain our own fork, um, and it's all static and stuff, and I don't really like it, so let's let's throw it away. Um, the other one is runtime function pointers, and this is where uh, the library doesn't have like the defined uh, functions for it, but it allows you to plug in your own function pointers. And for usability, this is pretty good because when you pass in a function pointer, it's actually type checked even in C. It's amazing, right? 
Um, so, uh, but the performance is not very good because the compiler won't be able to uh, always know ahead of time uh, which pointer uh, or, or which function gets pointed to. So it, it can't inline everything. Uh, if we look at the code at the top here, uh, we have our definitions for our function pointers. Um, they get stored here uh, in these uh, static variables. Uh, our initializer functions just takes them and stores them here. And our example looks pretty simple again, just enable, transfer, transfer, disable, result. Um, but our assembly, it's not as good. Like the initialization is pretty good. It's just moving the uh, uh, arguments to the, uh, to the fields over here. But our example is suddenly quite inefficient. Uh, we're doing all kinds of stuff, and mostly we're actually calling and branching out to the function that uh, is in the function pointers. So that's not very good performance. We want good performance, and it's even longer as well. So no, no, let's, let's take this away. Uh, another one is extern link time binding. So uh, our library doesn't really say uh, what functions there are, they're, they're, you just say like, hey, there are some somewhere over, I don't know where, uh, the linker will, will figure it out. And that's also kind of the problem with this because the linker will have to figure it out. And if the linker doesn't find it, or if there's a mistake, you will get a linker error. And uh, I've learned that I want to avoid linker errors as much as I can because they are not pleasant. What does the code look like? Well. This is the most simple of them all. Um, we just say, hey, they, these are extern. And then our example is pretty much the same. Uh, the, uh, again, to reiterate, the example is from the library's uh, perspective. Um, so what does it look like? Well, if we look at the uh, assembly over here, the example function is pretty good because I've written an implementation here and you need to, uh, this is normally done in another file but uh, here in Godbolt, uh, I've just done it over here. So the example function is pretty efficient, but we can all also see that these transfer, enable, and disable functions are now part of the public API because, well, extern private doesn't really make much sense. So that's logical, but our API is not public and I don't really know if that's a good idea. So uh, throw it away as well. Now we're going to look at Rust. What if we want both performance and usability? Well, Rust does provide uh, abstract interface machinery, and we can do it with generics and traits. Uh, and actually, if we use traits, we get more usability than C could ever offer us because we can reuse traits from the embedded hull. Um, so if we want to implement SPI, we just uh, take the SPI uh, trait from the embedded hull, and then any platform that implements that can just plug it in to our library and nobody needs to implement anything. So that's a huge plus. But for now, uh, we'll uh, stick to our own interface. And uh, what I've also done uh, is uh, using a struct to implement it in, uh, because I don't want to uh, use dynamic dispatch. I want to use generics for the performance. So my device here uh, contains the interface, and the interface is just the three functions that we saw and see as well. Um, so we've got a constructor for the device, and our example uh, now goes through self.interface, but all the functions are the same. And if we look at the assembly, I, I hope everything is big enough because there's a lot of code. Um, but we can look over here, and I had to trick Godbolt into showing the assembly, but it's all exactly the same. Just move instructions, that's it. And uh, the SPI implementation here can be part of the public API, uh, but you'll need an instance for this, uh, so that's, that's fine. So this is what our hardware interface looks like. Um, now let's look at our software interface. Um, and the software interface is more about um, how do we 
talk to the library uh, instead of to the hardware. And you can uh, split this up in uh, two uh, kind of levels, namely low level and high level. Low level is more about, hey, uh, how do we talk to the hardware? What are the registers or commands uh, the, the chip has? And if you want to make a library, uh, this is pretty much the minimal implementation you can get away with. Um, but if you want to make a really good library, uh, you'll also want a high level uh, part. And the high level uh, does not concern itself really with the hardware, but with the registers themselves, already an, an abstraction. And instead of saying, uh, uh, like the low level does, uh, instead of saying, uh, hey, I want to set register 12 uh, bit 3 to 1. Uh, no, we, we want to say, hey, I want to reset the chip. And then you will, then there is a function that will just do it. So that's the full implementation. Now, during this talk, I'm going to mainly talk about uh, the low level uh, side of things. But uh, you can do a lot of things in high level as well. Um, but yeah time. <laughs> so this is our uh, imaginary device. Uh, it's uh, a GPIO expander. Uh, it runs over SPI. It has six registers of each one byte. And uh, we want to do the following thing with it, just as an example. If the manufacturer ID is not zero, then we must set pin seven high. It's pretty easy. Uh, we need to read. We need to write something. It's a pretty good example. I uh, don't know if it makes, mu makes much sense, but yeah. So uh, here's what you would do in C. Um, you would uh, generally uh, define the register uh, definitions with either an, an enum or uh, macro defines, and then you'd provide some functions to uh, write and read those registers. And the only thing you really have are the raw words. You say, hey, to register 12, uh, write uh, 15, something like that. And to use those raw words, uh, maybe there are some helper uh, macros to set and read the bits. Uh, but that's not even always the case. So here's my example. Uh, at the top here, we've got our register definitions. I've put it in an enum. Uh, for our manufacturer, uh, I've provided some uh, masks and, uh, and a position to set our bits and, and read it out. And then we've got our uh, uh, read and write registers. And uh, for now, apparently for my imaginary device, this is the way to read it and this is the way to uh, write to it. Uh, you transfer the address and then transfer zero and you get the result. or uh, you transfer the actual value you want to write. Um, and in our example code uh, here, we first want to read the manufacturer ID. So we read register the ID register. We end it with the manufacturer mask that I've defined up here. And then we bit shift it with the amount of positions here. And if it's not zero, then we want to read the port register. Um, we want to uh, enable the seventh or rather eighth um, GPIO pin. So we set the, the, the uh, biggest bit and then we write back the register. So it's pretty straightforward, but it's not really, well, the API is not really that nice. But if we look at the assembly, the assembly is like perfect. If you had written this by hand, uh, it wouldn't look much different, well, except for the numbers maybe. Um, but we just move, 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 move. Uh, so that's pretty efficient. We do a compare and a jump. Oh, hey, that sounds like an if statement. We, co we compare and we maybe we jump. Uh, but we do more moves, we do an or, that's, that's this or, more moves and then return. So this is as efficient as it can be. But this API is, uh, I, don't, I don't really like it because we, uh, we need to do the mask ourselves. We need to do bit shifts. Um, we, we need to create a temporary register here. Um, it works, but I think we can do better. 
Um, and some of the things uh, can already be better uh, if we do it in Rust, because I, I almost forgot. Um, this register here, this address, the only valid values are one through six. But C doesn't stop us from just plugging in seven or a hundred. And what happens then? Well, uh, I don't know, um, but it's probably not good, but C will just allow you. And we can fix that uh, by doing it in Rust. So we actually use a proper Rust enum. Um, and if you plug in any other value, then uh, the Rust will give a compiler error. Uh, so everything else is still pretty much the same. We've got our device struct, uh, constructor, uh, and then we implement read register and write register, and they do pretty much the same. And in our example code, we say, hey, we've got our device based on our SPI. We read the manufacturer, uh, we mask it, we pitch shift it. If the manufacturer is not equal to zero, uh, well, everything really looks the same, but at least it's a little bit safer because we now use a proper enum for it. Um, and the, the assembly, the output, is still just as efficient. This is literally the same output. Um, so yeah, but we still got the problems that we need to mask and shift and create this temporary. We can do better in Rust. Uh, we can make it type safe. We can use types to do everything. Um, because if you think about it, every register is actually different because you've got an ID and a port. And the port controls pins and the ID just has some uh, ID values. Those are different. So why are we using a U8 or a char for all of them? What if we create uh, more types to represent the um, the registers, because right now the burden of correctness is on the user instead of the library writer, while the library writer probably has more knowledge about it. So we want to improve that. So uh, we can you uh, we can make it both easier and correct by default because we have a good example of where it's done already, namely the pack crates. Uh, they have a pretty good API, which is all uh, which is also very efficient. So let's use that as an inspiration and make something similar. So we want to define our registers in some way. So on our device, uh, we have the implementation here. And what we'll do is for every register, we'll have a function. Uh, so uh, for now, I'm only implementing the two registers uh, we really uh, need for our example but we've got the ID register and the port register. And what they do is they return a register accessor. And this is the trick we will use. Um, the register accessor uh, borrows the interface. So you get the object back, uh, which borrows like uh, the, yeah, the interface. So you can't use the device until you've uh, dealt with the register. And we use generics to wrap the R and W value around it. So what are the uh, W and R value? Well, we've got still underneath our raw register words, uh, but we want to make it type safe. So we, we wrap around it a new type that uh, pulls out all the data we need in, in a way we want or writes it back. And what does that look like? So for example, if we want to do it for the ID register, uh, well, uh, I've decided that the ID register is uh, read only. So we only create an R struct and it's around a U8, which is our, our word. Now our manufacturer number is now a function and the uh, masking is done uh, right in the function. We just get the U8 back. And, the, and apparently there's a version field as well, which get masks and uh, returned. And in our register accessor, uh, we have a specific implementation for our read uh, wrapper and our write, well, which is unit because it doesn't exist. 
Um, so we implement the read function, uh, which is just the same. Uh, we plug in the uh, address over here, and then we return the value we get from the hardware interface and wrap it inside our R uh, struct. And we can do the same for the port. Uh, here at the right is the uh, actual code for uh, enabling all the pins and reading the enable status. And then we can read, uh, write, and modify it. And this uh, uh, this API works pretty much the same as in the pack crates, uh, namely in the right, um, uh, yeah, in the right function. You uh, give it uh, a closure, and for the modify as well. Um, so, actually, that's it. So what does the API now look like? Well, if we want to uh, get the manufacturer, we just say, hey, device, I want to access the ID register, and I want to read it, and then I want to read the manufacturer field. So we just get it. Then if the manufacturer is not zero, uh, the device, we want to access the port register. We want to modify the port register. And what we do is our write object. We want to enable the seventh or, again, eighth um, GPIO because we set it to true. That's it. Uh, so now we've got a, a, a pretty good API, if you ask me, that doesn't allow for mistakes because all the shifting and masking is done uh, underneath this. But how efficient is this? Because, well, a nicer API, it's higher level. It, it's got to be more inefficient, right? Well, the answer is no. The assembly is exactly the same, uh, which is, I think, like amazing. Uh, it's exactly the same, while the API is a lot nicer. So um, you can go a lot further with this, but I haven't got time to really show you how to implement it. But I can show you a practical example of where I've implemented this myself. And it's here. Um, uh, this is what I've written for my job. And um, uh, I got permission to show it to you. And this is basically the same API, but a little bit more extended. And it's wrapped inside a macro to uh, easily implement all the registers. So I've got my LL device, low level device, and then I implement all the registers. So I've got a BMCR register. Uh, this is the address. It is read write. And these are all the fields that are in here. And I can just specify uh, at which uh, uh, bits uh, they are. Now, this register isn't really interesting, but if I go down, need to look for it a little bit. What's a good register? For example, here. So we see that uh, in the var control register, we've got the var timer. And it uh, takes uh, two bits of, uh, of width. But it doesn't return a bit. No, it returns a variance computation timer, which is just an enum over here because I don't want to deal with uh, the register being 0, 1, 2, or 3. No, I want to know, is it, well, this isn't properly documented, but uh, 2 milliseconds, 4 milliseconds, 6, or 8, which I think is a lot better than 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, and there are other examples here as well. Um, can I find them? Where are you? Oh, here, for example. So we've got... Uh, three bits over here, PTP trigger number. Um, yeah, so th these are a lot of registers, which is why I created this macro to, to implement, it, implement it all. Uh, for example, here, event capture, it can be zero or one, but I don't want to know if it's zero or one. I want to know if it's falling or rising. And um, yeah, so this is the low level API, but what does a high level look like or what's possible? Well, I've talked about the reset function. Um, we need to set the reset bit within BMCR. So we uh, go through self, low level device, 
BMCR register, we want to modify it and we want to uh, take the reset field and set the bit. But uh, like you can see here, there's a lot of documentation here that comes straight from the uh, data sheet. So if I hover over this, I can just see the documentation that's part of this. This bit, which is self-clear, returns a value of one until the reset process is complete. So if I want to know that the reset process is complete, I need to keep checking it. So I, I'll do that within the while loop. Haven't had to access the data sheet for this, which is pretty good, I think. And there's also another benefit, namely documentation. Uh, this is the generated documentation for this. Uh, and if I go to the low level, well, oh, well, here are all the registers. And I can just pick one. Oh, they all are small. And then go to the reader, and I can just read or, or yeah, what fields are in here. I can read what the register is for. So all the documentation is now part of my Rust documentation. Uh, which I think is fantastic. Um, let's go back. Yes. So I'm almost done. Uh, this is the conclusion. Um, uh, the API I've described is, I think, pretty good. And we can even use macros to make our lives even easier for implementing it. But uh, compared to the more C-like type, uh, the compile times are longer because, because we use generics and macros. Um, yeah, that's, ju that's just one of the costs. Um, maybe we can even generate it from a file. So we maybe we don't want to do it in macros, but maybe from a file, because the pack crates uh, also do it from the SVD files that are uh, part of the, uh, the, which go alongside the microcontrollers, therefore. So maybe that's a good idea. Uh, and a lot can be done in the high level part as well. Uh, I've shown you the reset function, which is pretty easy, but you can also use a lot of type state there because there is the DW1000 crate, which is a, a radio chip. And uh, it uses type state to manage uh, when the uh, radio is sending, receiving, or idle. Um, so yeah, uh, a, lot can, a lot more can be said and discussed. Um, and I hope to see some questions and discussion in, in the chat. Uh, but for now, I want to throw up a ball, maybe. Maybe we can create a unified device crate, which uh, maybe makes it easier to implement a good API, like the one I've showed you. Um, maybe we can have traits for a general, a device trait for which manages a power up reset maybe sleep, um, access to the API. Um, maybe that's a good idea that some of you would like to see. So we can maybe discuss about that. And with that, that's the end. I hope I'm not too much over time. <laughs> so uh, thanks for watching. And I'd love to answer any questions. Hi, we're running ahead of time anyways. <laughs> um, there's a number of questions in the channel and uh, definitely good feedback, but here's just the questions. Um, are you planning to open source your register creation macro? This is actually a question by James. Um, well, it's written for my job. I got permission to show it, uh, but my company is sadly not really into open source. Uh, mm. But... Um, yeah, if, if there's interest, I may be willing to do something in my uh, free time to, to set something up if there's interest, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, um, how slow is this in debug mode? Um, I presume it is like packs where it is much slower. Um, yeah, uh, I've not tested it, it for this right now, uh, but the benefits uh, or, or one of the things you can do in Cargo is you can selectively optimize uh, separate libraries. So if it's a separate library, you can just enable the optimizations there, and mm. then you won't get slowed down as much. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a bit slower, yeah. Okay. Um, one of the question, how does error handling regarding the underlying peripherals, for example, I2C bus errors work out here? Um, well, in my um, 
in my practical example, I've dealt with it that you, uh, whenever you read, um, you get an error back. So you need to do a, a question mark behind it, well, if you want. And every time uh, you actually read a field, uh, when you read a uh, an enum back, that can also go wrong because maybe it, uh, it hands you back the number 12, but your enums does, don't expect that. So every time you read that, you also get a, a result type. So it just works with result types, uh, but that's, you, you can really plug that in. That's doable, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then there's uh, one other question. Um, how is this related to SVD to Rust? Uh, it's not directly related, but the API is very similar. Uh, the ideas behind it are, well, yeah, similar. Uh, so that's the only connection, really. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, that's all the questions. There has been a lot of discussion in the chat. I also want to highlight how people have now gone to actually highlight the questions in chat by prefixing them uh, while having active discussions. So I leave you to the discussion around your subject. There's definitely a lot uh, that you can follow up on. And I'm very happy that the talks turn out to be, uh, the conversations go on until the next one starts. So you, there's always something to see during the breaks. And yeah, this is the next one coming up before the last talk for this section. Thank you for hosting me. <laughs>